Hello, we're going to be in Judges chapter 3 today. That starts the uh, terrible cycle of the book of Judges. The book of Judges is an example of God's people in the promised land, but not living for God. See, the promised land was not magic, but they had to learn that. It was God that was the key, not what he gives. We ought to hear that too. Let's look at it. Now, these are the nations which the Lord left. Now, earlier in Joshua, in, in uh, first part of Judges, it seems to imply that uh, they were left because the people of Israel did not fully um, pursue the uh, extermination of the Canaanites. But here's the other side, and that is that it was God that gave them both the ability and the uh, mental awareness and commitment to do it. God left some of the, of the Canaanites. Why? Well, it says here, to test Israel by them. Now, this idea of testing is very difficult for us, but it seems to be a biblical principle throughout the Bible. And that is that God is going to put us in a situation to show to us, not to him so much maybe, but to us, that we are committed to him. Uh, I think we see it, first of all, in Genesis 12. God tested Abraham by saying, Abraham, I want you to leave your family. I want you to leave the place you grew up, and I want you to follow me to a land that I'll show you. Now, Abraham didn't perfectly pass that test, as none of us do, because he took his father and Lot with him, and they, they moved to Haran, but they couldn't go to the promised land until after Abraham's father, Terah, died. And then God promised Abraham a son, but it was 13 years before that son came. And then when that son was somewhere around a teenage boy, Genesis 22, God said, Take your son, your only son that I've given you, the son of the promise, the son of the covenant, and sacrifice him on, on a mountain that I'll show you. Genesis 22, God tested Abraham. But there's more than that. Exodus 16:4, Exodus 20:20, 20, 20. Deuteronomy 8:2, Deuteronomy 8:16, Deuteronomy 13:3, Second Chronicles 32:31. And I look in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 4, Jesus was tested and tempted. I see the early church was tested and tempted. I think it's it's theologically accurate to say that it's not if a test will come, it's when. And it will probably come in the area of our priorities. God tested the people in this very unique promise that the land he swore to his fathers he would give them. But they had to act in faith. And I think it's a good example of this conditional, unconditional covenant. All covenants are unconditional in God's promise, in God initiating love, in God's power. But God has chosen that all that he initiates for us, we must respond to in faith. These people had to prepare for war, had to move out in the faith that God was going to give them the land. I think, I think that's the way it is with everything of how God deals with men. Now, in this particular test, you see in verse 2, only in order that the generations of the sons of Israel might be taught war. War in the sense not of killing each other, but in trusting God to rid the land of the Canaanites that he had promised. Now, this generations of the sons of Israel, you realize that Christianity is only one generation away from total extinction. Every generation of the sons of men must learn faith in God. And it's something that can't be passed on in the sense of personal experience. It can be passed on in the sense of how God has acted, who God is, how God has acted in the past. But God's got to act existentially in each one of our lives. That's why we emphasize as evangelicals that each one of us must have a personal experience with God. Not just believe past experiences, but have an experience of our own. And I think that's the truth. That's what it, it seems to be implying here. Now, this thing about taught war. I think if you look in the New Testament, particularly Romans 5, verses 3 and 4, you'll see that, that God moves us through cycles of maturity, uh, through testing and perseverance and on and on, and it leads on to a Christ-likeness. So I hope you'll look at Romans 5, 3 and 4 to see one of these progressive uh, passages that deal with God working with us through teaches in Christ. And I want to say one more word here before I continue. Quite often as a pastor, I've visited folks and they've said, Oh, uh, Brother Bob, why has this happened to me? I, I have done my best. I have served God. I have given to God. I pray. I read my Bible. We attend church regularly. Bob, why has this happened to me? See, if we're not careful, we begin to think that adversity is a sign of God's displeasure. When this seems to say that adversity is a sign of God's presence and working with us. I, I think that the, the book of... Uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 5, which says, If God doesn't discipline you, 
No, you are not one of his. Now, none of us enjoy discipline. None of us enjoy testing. But there's a purpose in testing and problems and crisis in our life that we're going to trust God through it all. Folks, there's a purpose. And the sign of problems is really a sign of the Lord's love, not a sign of the Lord's displeasure. The fact that most of us have no problems shows that we're not really living for God in our world. In verse 3, these are the nations, the five lords of the Philistines. Now, of course, uh, in Joshua 13, 3, the five cities of the Philistines are listed. If you'll look at a map in the back of your Bible, you'll see on the southwest coast of Palestine, and by the way, the word Palestine is a, a derivation of the term Philistines. We believe the, the Philistines, which are on the southwest corner of Palestine, and the Phoenicians, which are just to the north of the Sea of Galilee, also on the Mediterranean, are part of the Sea Peoples, the people of the Aegean Islands. Now, we know that the, that the Phoenicians were a seagoing people and probably had uh, trading camps along the coast. And the same is true probably the Philistines earlier because they're mentioned clear back in the book of Genesis. But they did not really come and settle in large numbers until around the 12th century B.C. They tried to, the 1200s, they tried to invade Egypt and were repulsed. And, and they settled on the southwest coast of Palestine. And they had five major cities. And there was a confederation of cities. And they are listed here as Gaza, Ashkelon, Ashdod, Ekron, and Gath. And you may want to see that on a map. This was a Philistine stronghold that's going to cause so much problems for the tribal allocation of Simeon, the tribal allocation of Dan, and the tribal allocation of Judah. Now, these, these lords of the Philistines, by the way, these were mercenaries, I think, and they had iron when nobody else had iron. It made them a formidable enemy. And the Canaanites. Now, the Canaanite is a general term. Sometimes these different tribes of uh, the land of Palestine are described by one word. Sometimes it's Canaanites, which means lowlanders. They lived along the coast. Or the Amorites, another collective term. You might want to see Genesis 15:16. And, and that means highlanders. They lived in the Judean highlands. And so it's, if it's by one, sometimes by one, Canaanite or Amorite. But sometimes it's done by three tribes, sometimes by five tribes, normally by seven tribes, but sometimes by ten tribes. And there is some confusion about the relationship of these tribes. I'll, I'll try to point that out as I go through this. Notice the Sidonians. Now, the Sidonians are, of course, these Phoenician people I were talking about. The two major cities are Sidon and Tyre. One way we know this is a very ancient account is because Sidon is list listed and not Tyre, and Tyre became the major city later on. That shows the historicity of this account. And then the Hivites. Now from Genesis 36 verses 2, 20, and 29, it seems that the Hivites and the Horites are the same people. It's even possible that the Hivites, the Horites, and the Hurrians are somehow connected. And we're not exactly sure of all those interrelationships. Some of these are Semitic people. Some of these are not Semitic people. Uh, and the Hivites who lived in Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal Hermon. Of course, here we have Hermon, Mount Hermon, that large mountain to the north of the Sea of Galilee. And the Baal of Hermon. Now, Baal is the male fertility god. And this was the Canaanite pantheon. Now, we know that El, from our studies of... Uh, uh, some of the archaeological finds, we know that El was the chief god of the pantheon, but Baal was the storm god, the fertility god. And his sister Ashtera, uh, or Astarte, had, had to, in some accounts, especially the Bible, ha were the consorts of each other. While in the literature we found it's El and Astarte, the chief god and Astarte are consorts. We're not exactly sure of that relationship, but there was a Baal of every city, which meant wide fertility worship. As far as Lebo Hamath, and we're not exactly sure of that. We think it's the entrance of Hamath. We're not sure. And they were, look again, for the testing of Israel to find out if they would obey the commandments of the Lord. Untried faith is weak faith at best. Oh, I, but I do love that passage in 1 Corinthians 10, 13 that says God will never give us more than we can bear. <laughs> Hallelujah. Which he could command their fathers through the hand of Moses. Okay, it's that divine revelation. Um, by the way, this, uh, this testing of Israel, that seems to be the major theological purpose of Satan. Now, as you know, Satan uh, in the Old Testament is not an arch enemy. He's a servant of God. You see that in Job chapter 1. Uh, I really believe probably the best book that I have ever read on the development of Satan uh, through the Bible 
is a book by A.B. Davidson called The Theology of the Old Testament, published by T.N.T. Clark. I hope you'll get that book if you're looking for the development from a servant of God to an arch enemy of God. There is a development. We think that some of that is seen in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, as far as the origin of evil and the fall of the evil one, Lucifer. Notice that it mentioned verse 5. And the sons of Israel lived among the Canaanites, there's the lowlanders, that you can use them to, as a collective term, among the Hittites. We see there are three groups of Hittites in the Bible. There's one over close to the Tigris Euphrates. There's one in central Turkey, and, there, and part of that central Turkey, which is the major population of Hittites, uh, seemed to migrate down into Palestine, and there was a group of Hittites in Palestine. The Amorites, they live in the hill country. The Perizzites, which seems to mean tent dwellers. The Hivites, which can also mean Hurrians, or it can mean Horites, and again, Genesis 36. Uh, and the Jebusites. Now, the Jebusites are the ones that lived in, around the city of Jerusalem, which was earlier called Salem, which was at this point called Jebus. And they were not fully defeated. At least the, the city was defeated, but the stronghold, the fort on top of the mountain, was not defeated until the time of David. Notice that it says, And they took their daughters for themselves as wives, and they gave their own daughters to their sons, and they served their gods. Now, this is an example of religious apostasy. Uh, you might want to see Exodus 34, 15 and 16, and Deuteronomy 7, 3 and 4. Uh, the problem here is not interracial marriage, but interreligious marriage. And the problem was that they were told to exterminate the Canaanites, and here they were becoming corrupted by the Canaanite deities. Um, I think you see that as a, as a cycle. It took the Exodus to cure them of this. Uh, notice then, and the sons of Israel did what was evil on the side of the Lord. What? Marrying these other women? No, it was the corruption of the mixing of religion. When they married these women, the women began to teach the children the things of idol worship. The men were corrupted. They didn't, uh, quote, they didn't uh, uh, make converts out of the women. The women made converts out of the Israelis. And forgot the Lord their God. I want to tell you, I, at this point it says you forgot the Lord your God. Would you read for me Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 11 through 20 when you get a chance? Oh, that we forget the things of God. I think of Psalms 103 where it says, do not forget his tender mercies. I think we tend to do that and think that our own strength, our own resources have brought us the abundance. No, it is our God. Read Deuteronomy 8, 11 through 20 and serve the Baals and the Ashtaroth. And there's those two groups, the male and, fertil male and female fertility god. Um, I think it's very interesting that this word Ashtaroth is translated by King James Groves. We believe that she was uh, worshipped by either a carved piece of wood, uh, a stake, or a live tree, and we're not sure. And the anger of the Lord burned against Israel. The God of love is also the God of anger. Um, and he sold them. Now, to sell them is the opposite of what? redeeming them. Redeeming them means to buy them back. God sold them. It's the exact opposite. As God judged the Canaanites, God's judged his own people when they did the same things. Into the hands of Cush Rishathim, king of Mesopotamia. There's several words there I want to pick up on. First is the word Cush. We learn from Genesis 10:8 uh, that Cush is the father of Nimrod and the founder of Babylon. But also later on in the Bible, Cush is related to Ethiopia or North Africa. And there's also a possible etymological connection between Cush and the, and the nation of Edom. So there's three possibilities. Now the word Rishathim means double wickedness. The Jews love to change the name of, of these kings and foreign gods by changing the vowels. And apparently they have changed the name to this double wickedness. Would your mother name you double wickedness? Well, quote, no. So this is probably a corruption of the way the Jews played on these names. Now Mesopotamia here, um, uh, today it means the, the Tigris Euphrates River Valley. But that's not true until the 4th century B.C. In this age, it seems to refer more to Syria, that northern part uh, where Damascus is the capital, uh, and not way over into uh, Iraq and Iran. Uh, and when the sons of Israel cried to the Lord, the Lord raised up the deliverer. Now the word deliverer and the word judge in verse 10, we call this the book of Judges, but it's not the, the word judge as we think. It's the word divine deliverer, a God-sent uh, redeemer, deliverer, to, 
to, to, to loose them from this. And this is a terrible cycle. They, they apostatize, they cry out to God, God sends the deliverer, and that happens over and over and over and over, and God help us over and over in the book of Judges. Now, notice that this particular deliverer is going to be Othniel. Now, we know him because he's the brother of Caleb. Now, remember here it says he's the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. You might want to see Joshua 14, 6, Joshua 15, 17. Now, Othniel and Caleb apparently are not Jewish. They're of one of the clans of Esau, but they are incorporated into Judah. And Caleb, of course, is a very famous uh, representative of the, of the, from Judah to the spies and later took the city of Hebron. His brother is a, another apparently godly man. You might want to see Judges chapter 1, verse 13, where he's mentioned. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. And I want to say again to you, we need to be careful about saying, well, in the Old Testament, the Spirit just came upon him, but the New Testament, he indwells him. Be careful of these simple little characterizations that don't really often hold water. I think the Spirit of God was active in the Old Testament in a real sense as he is in the New Testament. I realize there's a specialty sense in the New Testament, but the Spirit of God was active. You might want to also compare Numbers 24-2 and 1 Samuel chapter 10, verses 6 and uh can't read my own writing. I think 6 and 10 uh, to see how the Spirit of God has, was active in the Old Testament. And when he went out to war, the Lord gave him this king of Mesopotamia into his hand. Notice God is in control here. Um, and the peace lasted 40 years, which is about one generation. Now the word 40, I think, is a long period of indefinite time, not exactly calendar year. And the sons of Israel did evil on the side of the Lord. Look at verse 12. It's going to happen again over and over. So the Lord strengthened Eglon, king of Moab. Now, God is going to use foreign nations, evil nations, corrupt nations to train and punish his own people as God uses evil things to train and punish us. Here we have the king of Moab. We also have in Isaiah 10, 5, the nation of Assyria. Uh, we have, let's see, in Isaiah, I can't read my own writing. I believe it's 45, 11, Cyrus of Persia. And then in uh, Ezekiel 30, 24, we have, and, and Jeremiah 27, 6, we have Babylon. God uses these foreign nations. as it, It's kind of like uh, Romans 8, 28, uh, for God causes all things to work together for good. Not all things are good, but God can cause things. So God's going to judge them by another nation, Edom. And he gathered himself the sons of Ammon and Amalek. Now Ammon, of course, Ammon and Moab are, are the nations from Lot and their, his incestuous relationship with his daughters back in Genesis. Amalek is that nomadic tribe that the Jews hated so bad because they attacked the stragglers uh, in the Exodus experience, killed the old men and the children. And Amalek is used as a symbol of evil throughout the Bible. Um, okay. And they defeated Israel and they possessed the city of Palms. Now you say, well, that's got to be Jericho. And it, it possibly is Jericho because it's called the city of Palms in Deuteronomy 34.3. But it seems there's another city called the city of Palms in Judges 1.16 that seems to be a southern oasis, probably Tamar. So we're not exactly sure which city of Palms this is. Now they served the king of Moab for 18 years. And the people cried out to the Lord. The Lord raised up the deliverer. Uh, Ehud from the sons of Gera. And you might want to see Genesis 46, uh, 21, where it's mentioned. It's one of the Benjamite clans. Uh, they were ambidextrous or left-handed. You might want to see 1 Chronicles 12, 2, or Judges uh, uh, 20, verse 16. Left-handed man, and he was to take the tribute to Eglon, but he strapped a sword, a two-edged sword, about 14 inches long. Now, this is it says a cubit here, but the rabbis say this is a different word than the normal word for cubit. It's a short cubit. A normal cubit is from the longest finger to the elbow. The rabbis say this is from the knuckles to the elbow, about 14 inches. This was some switchblade, I want to tell you. Strapped it to his right thigh, and he went in and took the, 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 uh, the men brought this uh, tribute to Eglon. It says he was a very fat man. You're going to see why. And when the people left, uh, Ehud went out. And it says, you know, see, turn back from the idols which were at Gilgal. Now, the word idols here, Really, it can be the word quarries or a cra a gra a graven images. But because of Joshua 4, 19 through 24, where these stones were put up at Gilgal, I think this is Joshua's memorial is talked about. And when he saw that, maybe he was encouraged to, to do what he planned to do because he strapped that, that knife to his thigh for a purpose. But apparently he chickened out when he was in the presence of Eglon or either it was a plan where he planned to go back, but we're just not sure. And he told the king, he went back apparently and said, I've got a message for you. And the king said, everybody leave, everybody leave. And he, the king said, what message? And Ehud said, 
I've got a word from God for you. And the king stood up and he took this sword and jabbed it in his stomach. And he was so fat, the fat went around the blade. Ooh, yuck. Now he's up here on the... I get so tickled. If you ever read Flavius Josephus, who is a Jewish historian during the life of Christ, who tried to, to explain the Old Testament to Romans is basically what he tried to do. He has great detail about this. Now, I don't know if he how he knew, unless it was oral tradition, it was kind of passed down, but he has great detail about it how the doors were locked and exactly how things happened. Now, the king was up on the roof chamber, flat roofs in that day. It, that was a place of the social life to keep cool. And there was apparently a, a little room up here where he uh, had cord. Maybe he slept. Also, there was a restroom up here. And so notice that he, he jabbed this in. And notice verse 22. It says, and refuge came out. Well, it's, there's a Hebrew word here that's not used very often. And it may mean that the blade came out the back. It may mean that his uh, intestines were perforated and refuge came out. We're not sure exactly, but you can see the, the gross deal. The blade went all the way in, and he left it in there. A 14-inch knife, and was totally covered up. It's really a, a, a very overweight man. And Ehud just closed the door behind him and locked it. The servant said, oh, the master is, is a, he's using the bathroom, so we'll just leave him alone. And verse, it says, um, verse 24, he is only relieving himself in the cool room. Now, the word relieving himself is literally the covering of his feet. You might want to see 1 Samuel 24. Remember Saul went in the cave to relieve himself, and David and his men were hiding in the cave? Uh, when you would, if you're wearing a robe and you dropped your robe so you could use the bathroom, your, your robe would cover your feet. So this became a euphemism or a symbol of just um, um, relieving yourself, and that's why the, the idiom is used here. Now, notice that the Ehud escaped. They didn't catch him, and he went back to the, uh, the promised land. He blew this trumpet, this ram's horn, a military signal. They all rallied to him. They came to the fords of Jordan, which is the crossing places, the only place you could cross the Jordan. They captured those. They attacked the Moabites. Look at verse 29. They killed 10,000 of them, uh, their, their uh, uh, most valiant warriors, and he delivered Israel for 80 years now. Two generations he delivered. The first one, 40 years. The second one, 80 years. But guess what happened? Another generation arose that did not know the Lord. Golly, that tells us we've got to be diligent in teaching our children about the Lord. One generation. And this kind of tragedy occurs. Now, chapter 3 ends with one more judge. And we have seen here two judges so far. Othnel, Caleb's brother, and Ehud, uh, a Benjamite. And now we're going to find a little, we call this a minor judge, only because, not because he did something less significant than the others, or he was less called by God or less used. We just don't know much about him. Uh, it's a very little reference. It's only here, and his name is Shamgar. And after him came Shamgar. Now, Shamgar is not a Hebrew name. Many of us think it's Hurian or Horite or Hittite. We're not sure. It's not Hebrew. So God's using people who aren't Jews to deliver his people, right? Uh, Othniel, Shamgar, are not of, of the lineage of Jacob. A the son of Anath. Now, Anath is a Canaanite goddess. I believe she's the war goddess. Uh, and there is a city called Ben-Anath. It's a city up in Galilee. We're not, we're not exactly sure uh, the connection of this man to the, to the Jews. Who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goad. Now, an ox goad is about an 8 to 10 uh, foot a wooden pole with a metal point on the end. And it was used to poke up there by the ox's head and kind of hit him on the shoulders, uh, poke him in the side. Now, th he killed 600 Philistines with an, ox, with, with an ox goad. Wouldn't you like to know a little more about that? Boy, that sounds like one of the exploits of Samson later on, doesn't it? He used a, the jaw of a donkey. This man used an ox goad. Uh, you might want to see chapter 5, verse 6, where an allusion to this is made a little bit later. And it says, he saved Israel. Now, I want to minutes to you, the word uh, saved in the Old Testament does not mean spiritual salvation. It means physical deliverance. Uh, this is one place, I think you can see it in the New Testament, in James chapter 5, where it talks about praying for the sick. The prayer of faith will save the sick man. Well, I don't think this means that the man in the, who's a member of the church, obviously, needs to be spiritually saved. I think he already is. He needs to be physically saved or redeemed. And that's what the word implies in the Old Testament, physical deliverance. And so he delivered Israel. It does not say for how long he delivered Israel. So maybe it was not a total deliverance that lasted 40 years like the other two judges. Uh, but we, ha we see here that the Philistines are going to be a major problem uh, just like these other uh, surrounding nations are throughout the, the, the period of Judges. 
And it's not that these nations were stronger, it's that the Israelis were sinful. It's their idolatry. It's their amalgamation uh, with the cultus of Canaan that causes God to judge them. God is no respecter of persons. It says in uh, Exodus 15, 16, that the, the sin of the Amorite is not yet full, which means that God gave them time to repent. They would not. God judged them. When Israel did the same thing that the Canaanites did, the Amorites, God judged them too by the exile. Now, no, I think it's very important we say that God's covenants are always unconditional initiated by him but they're always conditional on our response each generation's response that's why I think we can say that there are no grandchildren in, in biblical faith there are only those who have had a personal experience of faith with God and through the covenant and this personal experience is developed through problems and stresses but you see the love of God when they got away, he would not let them go. He brought them back. Folks, I want to tell you, and I hope you'll think about this, God's discipline in your life, problems, uh, even his punishment for you getting away from him is a sign of his love, is a sign of his care. Uh, don't misunderstand the things that are happening to you. As God loved and worked with his people, as he was long-suffering and patient with them, even though they did such terrible things in the presence of great light, God will work with us for the goal of Christianity is just not going to heaven when we die. The goal of all this is our Christ likeness now, our walk of faith with him now. Oh, I hope you can catch this. The Old Testament is not really a way to be right with God. It's a horrendous history of how man can't be right with God. And I'm so glad that Galatians 3 shares with us that the Old Testament was to lead us to Christ. And there's a new day, a new way. Well, I've enjoyed being with you, and I hope to see you again, same time, same place, next week. God bless you.